All right, so first off, glad to be here. Coach Adams is my guy. I met him, what, 10 years ago when I was lunging at the track? <laughs> and uh, we got a chance to talk and then met Coach Deegan for baseball, and we've basically been friends, and I've got to do this periodically over time. And so I was thinking about what could I share with you guys that at this exact age, 18, 19, 20, 21, that probably impacted my life to be able to accomplish some of the honestly wildest dreams I even thought was possible. And it all came down to when I was 17, 18, 19, I was trying to really figure out what I wanted to do with my life, as we all are. And some of you guys are in some type of thing you're majoring in now, doesn't mean that's probably even what you'll end up doing, and that's okay. And some of you know exactly what you want to do, and that's okay. But I was in kind of like a unfortunate spot, super humble beginnings, lived in a trailer, single mom, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I liked to do one thing, and that was lift weights. Now, mind you, in 1990, I graduated high school in 1997. I'll be 46 years old this year. There was never a personal trainer remotely close to my town in coal country that actually had a job lifting weights. So it was a fictitious job that people have in California. By the way, I couldn't Google search it because there's no Google. I'm trying to paint a picture to you guys that I was thinking about going into a profession. I had never met anybody that actually did it before and it worked. So it was a little bit scary, right? But my opportunity was if I could save enough money to move to Columbus, the big city, because I'm from the like Caddis, Steubenville, Ohio Valley, it's about three hours away from here, that I could get, shout out to the Ohio Valley. And it's like, then what could really happen if I could give myself a chance, all right? So my mom got remarried, I'm a fourth generation coal miner. So my great grandfather died in the coal mine in the 1930s in a coal mine explosion. I've got him tattooed right here. He was the first weightlifter, fourth generation coal miner and weightlifter. My dad, my uncles, my grandpa, everybody, right? So my stepdad, my, my mom gets remarried and he's just, he's, he was underground 40 years. He's just explaining to me about this guy at work that's messing with him. And he said, he's a guy that doesn't drink, doesn't cuss, lifts weights, take care of himself. He don't look like he spent 40 years underground. And he said, this guy keeps messing with me. I'm just, I'm gonna put him in the dirt. Now, that's like how the coal miners talk about taking their face and basically jamming it in the fucking, in the, in the coal. And he said, and he better pack a lunch. And that, what that meant was, he better not run out of gas because I'm not gonna run out of gas. And I'm gonna be relentless at, he better be ready to go. But when he said it, I picked it up in a different way. I picked it up like, oh, that's probably how I'm gonna have to approach all of this to make a generational change. And then this is my actual lunchbox when I was a coal miner. So shortly after that, I got a job in the coal mine. So the opportunity was I could get this job to make, mind you, 14 bucks an hour, which you could probably deliver pizza for that nowadays, 14 bucks an hour, but the overtime was 21. So, and I could work as many hours as I wanted, as I physically could do. My best paycheck was 93 hours. Now, most people get paid every two weeks. We got paid every week. 93 hours in one week. So that's over 50 hours of overtime. And I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of an idea of what that looks like. The coal mine top is between 36 and 45 inches. That's like working under this table right here. So I'd be for 14 to 16 hours shoveling coal onto this belt line that's probably as wide as this right here that's humming so fast that you can't even hear. And I got a guy on each side. I'm on one side, he's on the other side. And there's coal almost as high as this. You can't even see. And you're just shoveling your way for 14 hours. They would leave your lunchbox about where the six hour mark would be. And you'd shovel your way there, you'd eat lunch, and you just keep on going. And I remember thinking my opportunity was to do that for as many hours as possible so I could leave and go to community college, not fucking Denison, community college for one year. That was my opportunity because that's all I could afford to then maybe get a fictitious job that I've never met anybody that it actually worked for. Maybe I could own my own gym. Maybe I could be a personal trainer. 
when I worked in the mine, the first day I went on the, on the elevator, I had this like 60 year old coal miner who played football for Navy. Huge dude. They called him Wuchi. He said, college boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? So I want to be a personal trainer. He said, like Richard Simmons, which only coach probably old enough to know, but it's the worst possible example you've ever seen in your life. I don't even know how to explain it, but it's bad. Look up Richard Simmons when you guys get a chance. But I said, no, that's not what I, what I want to do, sir. But I'm, I'm looking for, I just am coming here to work so I can get a chance. So what I did was I put my head down and every day I worked as many possible hours as I physically could. I packed a lunch. And I earned a spot and an opportunity to come here to go to school for one year. And by the time that first year was out, I had my certificate from Columbus State and I started personal training. That was 1999 I started my LLC. My last actual W-2 job where I got paid was being a coal miner. I've been a fitness professional for 25 years and I founded multiple seven-figure businesses. Got to live my dreams, worked with my idols, Arnold Schwarzenegger, worked with Tiger Woods, Louis Simmons, sold in 60,000 retail doors. Literally, I've got to do things I never even thought was possible. 13 covers of magazines, like unbelievable stuff. But this is what they all respect because they know when they deal with me, I'm not the most talented, but I'm the most consistent. And one of the main things I wanna share with you guys today is that consistency is a superpower that's available to everyone. But a lot of people are, just don't tap into it. So I like to think of it like this. Somebody's always trying to take your spot. So me and Canyon, we have the same spot. I'm gonna pack a lunch every fucking day. So he has to bring it, because if not, I'm taking his spot. And then when I take his spot, I'm gonna keep packing it to keep pushing. Now I'm pushing him because I wanna be his best teammate. But if he ain't packing his lunch, I'm taking it. And then when I take it, I'm gonna keep going. But if he beats me just because he's better than me, because like just actually more talented, then I'm okay with that. Because that means I really gave it my all. So don't get it twisted. You guys are trying to take somebody's spot in a good manner. Somebody's trying to take your spot. Somebody's also trying to take my spot. Do you don't think that someone wants my spot? These followers, this money, this situation, this life? Of course they do. So if, when I decide not to pack this, I'm willing to maybe give that spot up. You know what I'm saying? My dude, you okay? You awake? Yeah, okay, just making sure. I've seen it. So that's the point. It's real. Because that dude falls asleep, I'm taking his fucking spot. I know it, 100%. And I love that. When it rains and I'm out lunging, half hour or half mile, mile, I know the dude that's staying home because it's raining, but that's not me. Now, there's bump in the road, there's things that happen, I understand that, but the reality is, you guys have to take that approach every day. It's not just here, it's in life. Because somebody is the kid that's like me, that grew up in the trailer, that never thought they were gonna make a, you know, amount to anything potentially, that got a 13 on their ACT. Guys, I've sold millions of dollars of products. The book you got right here, I just bought an island. I literally just bought an island and wrote this book. This book's not actually about the island, but it's about how I got to that point. I've got to be able to accomplish a lot of things, not because I'm really that talented, it's because I'm that consistent. And I've made a ton of mistakes. Sounds like y'all just made a mistake and had to go through the repercussions of that, but that's okay. Here's the key is though, just is what it is. When I, uh, I had a big business called Muscle Farm that did really well, and then it didn't end as well as I wanted to. I didn't make as much money as I thought I should, which that's whatever, an entitled statement. I didn't end it the way I wanted, and I was working with my idol, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's one of my business partners. And I had lunch with Arnold a couple months later, after he left the company and after I left the company. And he said to me, it's all what you do next. Are you gonna be just a guy that did it one time? Or is this what you do? Everybody has bumps in the roads, but how do you step up the next day and then keep doing this? So then I had to go rebuild it again. But that's the first thing he said. He didn't say, oh, it should've went this way. Oh, you should've done that. He said, what are you gonna do next? Because he also, like anyone else that's been successful, you're gonna make so many mistakes, but then you can't let it define you. You just get better. I don't even look at it like a loss. 
I just look at it like a lesson. I just learn from it. Now here's the thing, don't repeat it. You guys just went through this, if you do it again, you're idiots. Guys that work for me, with me, not even for me, like younger entrepreneurs that I work with, they make a mistake, we just have one of our top guys make a mistake. Bro, next time we just gotta have a better sign off, just don't repeat it. Everybody screws up all the time. So a lot of this stuff that's out here right now, everyone's just afraid to fail. So they overanalyze. They don't start things. I actually try to rush to that point because the person that overanalyzes, I'm gonna beat them every day. Because you're waiting and I'm moving, I'm taking action. That's it. And the thing is, when it comes down to just keeping this mentality, coach is gonna notice that. Your position player is gonna, your position coach is gonna notice that. It didn't matter, I'm telling you guys, I went from interviewing Arnold Schwarzenegger and working with him, a month later I was on the range with Tiger Woods for an entire day. And we talked about all kinds of amazing stuff. Man, that dude's like the goat, two goats I was with within a month. All they talked about was work ethic, consistency, messing up, getting back up, and all they respected was this. They didn't care about the numbers, they didn't care, Tiger actually had a lot to ask about like different uh, just diet protocols and stuff because he was super into it. Arnold had already you know, had that game, but the reality is that's what everybody can identify with because if you want to be great, there's no other way. And you're not even guaranteed it, that's the thing. You're not even guaranteed to the time frame, you're not even guaranteed the outcome, but I can guarantee you this, if you don't try and you don't operate like this, it's definitely not gonna happen. That's the difference. So if you don't give it that level, you got no chance. If you give it the actual level, you actually have a chance. Then there's where the magic is. You put all of this time in, all of this belief, all of this work for an opportunity for it to maybe happen. And then some things just magically kind of come your way when you least expect and go, oh, that's, that's what I was waiting on. That's what I was hoping for. And so the get lucky, I'm not lucky. None of this shit is on accident. It's all on purpose, it's all intentional. And every day, my alarm clock, well, not every day, I'm sorry. I get up at like 5.36 on Saturdays and Sundays. 3.20 a.m., Monday through Friday. I'm at the gym by 4 a.m. It's, it's a non-negotiable. At 4 a.m., Monday through Friday. It's been like 15 years. So that's what you have to be willing to do to take my spot. And I know people are just aren't willing to do it. And if I've been doing it for this long and I'm gonna keep on doing it, it's gonna be harder for you to take my spot. Now, in my industry, drug use is super high. I'm a drug-free bodybuilder. You guys can tell I'm not that big. But I was still able to be on the cover of magazines, 175 pounds, 180 pounds, you know, I had some cr kind of crazy powerlifting stuff in my past too, you can check it all out. But the reality is I've had to go against guys that have better genetics, guys that take steroids, guys that have this, guys that have that, all of that. Same thing in some of your guys' sports. But I didn't let it limit me and I didn't go to those levels because I knew it might take me a little bit longer. But my son who's a, a freshman in college, he's in the lifting now, he sat down one day and asked me, Dad, why didn't you do that route? Because you probably would have had maybe more covers or maybe more fans. I said, because I knew you'd ask me this one day. I knew it. And I didn't want to say I was able to do all that stuff, but it actually came from the work. It actually came from the understanding. It actually came from the application. And that was the key. Um, so when I think about things, I think, what's the work I got to put in? And then what's my outcome? If my outcome isn't the way I want it to be, how do I gotta educate myself so I can get a better outcome? And then how many more reps do I gotta put in to hopefully get what I want? And so if, I don't, if I'm working and I get something or I try to, try to do something that doesn't work, I look inward, not outward. So if you're getting beat for your position, don't think it's the coach or this guy's mom or this or that or he's friends with this guy. You look inward first. What can I do better? So there's been all kinds of economic stuff as I've built these businesses. And I know they're there, but I never rest on that's the outcome. I say, how can my team, how can I motivate people, how can I change things first to get better? Not 
mm, this guy's president, or, oh, you know, there's a lot of supplement companies now, or that guy's got bigger chest muscles, whatever the hell it is. It's always inward first. So please, that's the biggest thing. When people start to blame and look and choose those type of outcomes, you're already defeating yourself. Even if it's not true, look inward first because you're still gonna get better through that process. Um, see if there's anything else. I brought this book for you guys today. I want you guys to uh, open up the page 73 for me real quick. So this book, I bought an island and wrote a book is literally what happened. I um, was looking on Zillow one day and literally found an island on Buckeye Lake. Now, I never drove a boat, had a boat, was really on the water. I had been to the lake one time. Coach actually used to live on the lake for a long time. This, this island sat there for 100 years and no one could figure out the permitting, boring utilities under the water. There's literally like an old story from Think and Grow Rich called Three Feet from Gold. And it means no one did enough research or had the balls to figure it out for the outcome, okay? And so I found it on Zillow. I bought it within two weeks and two days. And it sat there for 100 years. And probably by mid-July, I'll have a shipping container house a shipping container gym, and it will be a developed island. So during the process, I had taken two or three college dudes there to help me like just move a bunch of brush because I couldn't like barge anything over yet or any equipment. And one day, after we had worked on it, I woke up and I just had this idea. And so I turned my phone off because we're all distracted by that, including myself with all the social media. And I drove to the island and I just wrote this book in one half a day. Now. I told you guys I only got a 13 on my ACT, which is pretty laughable, but this is, like, me having books is actually, like, my whole family thinks it's hilarious because I was the anti-school guy, right? But although I have an entire library of books at my house and probably went through a 1,000 audiobooks, I've self-educated myself at a high level since I left school. But anyway, so a couple of things I want to share with you guys are the key takeaways of the book. Look, the book takes an hour to read, so please read it. But number one, Nothing on 73, nothing is going to be perfect, just start. This book is not perfect. This speech is not perfect. My gym is not perfect. But I'm going to sell a lot of these books. My gym has been around for 25 years. The companies grow to seven figures, but they had to start. So there's a lot of people that just waited because they thought version one had to be version two, version 10. It doesn't. They evolve over time. You have to start and take action. That is one of the biggest keys to whatever your dream is going to be. You have to start and you can't be scared. And there's going to be people around you that don't believe. But here's what you got to understand. Nobody really knew what I was willing to do. So when I got advice that was disbelief, they could never really know what I was really willing to go through. Um, on page 76, authenticity is the cheat code. There's only one version of you guys. I am such a weird mix of 90s rap and self-development in 1970s bodybuilding and multiplied powerlifting, which I, I like golf on top of it. Um, like there's like, I'm such a weird mix. I, we do eight foot rim dunking in the summertime as an extra workout because that's like the funnest shit of everyone that has done that knows it's fun right? So it's like I've competed in powerlifting and bodybuilding my whole life. Like all of these things that are like hobbies for most people, they're what I do because it's just me. You can't rip me off. These shoes I painted in my football field in my backyard for my turkey bowl. Coach has seen it. We had Braxton Miller out there before, Beanie Wells, all kinds of stuff. Nipsey sweatshirt because he's inspiring to me because he was an indie guy, meaning indie, uh, independent guy. So everything he did, he was in his own lane. He said, there's no traffic in your own lane. That's the authenticity. Every time I've leaned into being more like myself, it's worked better. Don't blend in. Blending in is everybody that can be the same. Be yourself. The problem is I can sniff it on people in five seconds when they're trying to act like someone different. They do it around me all the time. I would rather you be a goofy whatever, just be you. Because if you're just you, it's gonna work better. Blending in is not the move. Being you, because no one can ever rip you off. And so every time I go, 
It's kind of a weird little situation of how I operate or do. People lock onto it. I tell authentic stories. People lock onto it. Whenever my intuition of I stood on this island, I swam over to it, is completely overgrown. I stood on it, and I'm listening to my intuition. Oh, man, this is going to be an undertaking, but, boy, it's going to be sweet when I have Jake Owen, Morgan Wade playing concerts for me out here, when I can invite people to come out, like all this crazy stuff, right? I could see it all in my head. But when you're authentic and you push, there's an intuition that I can't deny, like because I believe in myself so much. To believe in things you can see and touch is no belief at all, but to believe in the unseen is a triumph and a blessing from Lincoln. I can see it in my head and then I work backwards to make it work. The problem is, when society presses you down and you're not authentically yourself, that stuff starts to get kind of hazy and you're not seeing it no more. Uh, next one is number three. Don't go to your deathbed with regret. Anytime you're scared, you should think, is the 95-year-old version of me going to be pissed I didn't try this? Because guess what? Whoever you thought didn't think it was going to work, they're probably not around you already know this when you leave high school, how many people you still talk to. Same is going to be with college. Same as when you get older. So do I really give two shits? I don't. Because I'm just, I don't want to go with regret. I don't want to think, what was I, what, what should I have been, been doing? What if I stayed in the coal mine, made $80,000 a year, worked a crazy amount of hours? That was probably going to be my future. But guess what? That was the B plan. And I already did it. And I was actually pretty good at it. It's in my blood. I know how to work like that. Everybody I've been around been that way. But what happens if I actually believe in myself and I try this? Could something be completely different about generations of my family because I've, you know, got a different financial IQ now. I can teach my mom. I can teach my kids. I, my mom's highest paying job is doing customer service for my app. She works at home. I need somebody that can be in my bank account from time to time to refund people or do stuff with money. She was looking for a part-time job. I taught her how to do customer service on the Corey G Fitness app. If you download that, it's $14.99, by the way. Just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so that's the point. So the reality is, when I left home coming out of the coal mine in 1999, if I don't give myself a chance, dude, I think that there could be thousands of people across 50 countries or whatever, I have people in almost every country that do my workouts from the old school gym, which is right down the street. And at bodybuilding.com's height, when I wrote the Get Swole plan, we had 28 million page views. When I did the Squat Every Day plan, where I squatted something heavy every day for three years, and we did that plan on her, it had like almost 60 million page views. And then, at the height, I wrote the blueprint to cut in mass with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I sat in his office for three days. When I would walk to the bathroom, the Conan Barbarian sword was sitting in the corner. We had Lifestyle Predator, Lifestyle Mr. Freeze, and I'm going through every take of pumping iron that probably a handful of people in the world have ever even seen to then remake a sizzle reel for a workout that I wrote with the goat himself and then ask him to do a new voiceover on top of that footage that I wrote. Do you think... If I don't leave that coal mine, I even get a chance to sniff that. I didn't even think any of that shit was possible. But that's what was possible. And if I don't listen to my intuition and I don't give it hell, then I'm going to the deathbed with an awful lot of regret because my life would be completely different. Uh, next one, 81. Page 81. The sauce is in the change around you. You have to be the person for your circle. I'm the person that changed everything in my family forever. Now, somebody in your family might have already done that. Maybe, maybe not. But there's other ways that you can do that. You're going to be around your group of friends. You're going to be at your work. You're going to be at your team. But when you start operating like this and things start to happen, people start to wonder, well, what's he doing? Why is he getting up so early? Why is he making himself better? Because then the influence is around you. So the sauce is in the change around you. That's the most impactful. Not just about material items, things you can do, whatever. It's seeing people change around you. Uh, next one. We're almost done. We're almost done. Number 86. 
Refine the consistent process. You have to have a process, guys. You have to have a process. And you gotta add and subtract things. So mine is, I'm up at 3.20, I'm at the gym at four. I train from four to 5.30, I got a full-time camera guy there that's ca capturing the stuff for the app. So I start my job really at four, right? I mean, I can start my job whenever the hell I want, but that's the time I started at because that's the most productive for me. I go from four to 5.30, I, condi I condition from 6.30 to seven, but, or from 6.30 to 7.30, but while I'm conditioning, I'm also doing an audio book. When I say I've went through probably a thousand books, I'm not playing. It's been 15, 20 years, every day. An hour of study, an hour of training, an hour of conditioning. That's happening every day, guys. So once again, people want my spot. I don't want to give it up. I want to be the starter as long as I can be, right? After I get to that, that's like my first job, essentially. I go home, take a shower, get the kids to school, back at the office between 8 and 8.30 for my second job, which is max effort running a seven-figure supplement business. We run that from, I don't know, usually nine to 12 or one. And then I still, for fun, help some high school kids, which by the way, we capture that content with Content Kyle and put it on. And then we do books and products and whatever. But all day, it's around training, development, trying to get better. Training, development, trying to get better. But you have to have a process. That process works for me, it might not work for you. But you need a version of that to stay on track. And then I think the last one on page 88 is discipline is rewarded. Now, the thing about discipline is it's not punishment. And I think that's how people think of it a lot. When you take the, hey, I can't, I wanna get abs, I can't eat pizza every day. That discipline's rewarded by you're gonna be in better shape, you're gonna have less brain fog, you're gonna feel better, you're gonna feel more confident, you know, everything's gonna be better, right? So a lot of people take that into account that I'm taking something from their life. When you add discipline in your life, you're actually giving yourself more of a chance because the person that's exercising more discipline is building more confidence, is gonna have more belief to take the chances to honestly progress their life. And that's the reality. So what I want you guys to take by listening to me today is just these few things that you can import into your life. This you can just maybe thumb through from time to time when you need some inspiration. I'm real easy to get a hold of too. And the reality is, is just that it's, it's not whether it's going to work. It worked for me, guys. It worked. I did a job I never met anybody that did. I pursued it really at a relentless pace that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, by the way. I make people uncomfortable. When I'm at parties, I'd be at parties when I was your age, getting ready for bodybuilding shows, I'd be chilling, drinking water. Still trying to be out there having, you know, having fun. Oh, are you too good to drink? No, nah, man, I'm getting ready for a bodybuilding show. Oh, they, uh, oh, but you're, not, you're too small for being a bodybuilder. I said, well, they have weight classes. And then I'd be peeled to the bone. I'd show them the abs. I'd be like, oh, shit, what's that diet like? I'm player, you ain't going to do it anyway. So I'm not even going to tell you. But my reality is that I started at that, 2021. And I just never gave it up. And I'm still doing it at a pace that I enjoy it. And if anything, I want my kids to do, I want them to do something that they love to do that isn't easy, it's gonna be hard, but then you can have a fulfilling life that's enjoyable. And that's what I really want you guys to take, is I do something I get up every day and love, and it's been difficult, but it's been fun, and it's been enjoyable, and it's really available to everyone if you guys are really about it. So that's what I had. Thank you. And I was going to do too, Coach, is if, um, if you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them because I know I just kind of rambled for a little bit. But if anything popped in, please, please answer them because I'd like to knock that out real quick. Has anybody got anything? Good. What time do you go to bed? Uh, between 9 and 10. Yeah, so here's the other thing is I know there's a bunch of like, stuff out there on sleep and quality. You can say you do eight hours of sleep, but it's shitty. It don't matter. And I wore the little whoop thing for a little while and I averaged 90, 92 to 97% every night. So a lot of that's based on keeping your insulin stable during the day, making sure that you're eating quality stuff. I manipulate my insulin right before night, meaning I don't eat my sugars till at nighttime, which kind of puts me into a little bit of a kind of a crash on purpose. I get a high quality sleep, keeps, uh, you know, once again, I never took any drugs, but I get, I get my levels checked and my, my basically my testosterone and all that stuff has kind of stayed the same 
literally for pretty much my entire adult life. I've never been a guy that's like some crazy athlete walking around like 600 testosterone. I literally am like a normal dude, it's like 400. But it's been like that when I was young and now that I'm older. So it's really hadn't really changed. But yeah, I try to get a real high quality um, six hours. The other thing is I do like drink alcohol on the weekends and try to cheat. Like I try to have a lifestyle to it. It's just not all gas all the time. I have a thing with men's health coming up on May 9th where I gotta go to New York to do some content and stuff with the magazine. And so I'll have to dial it in for five, six weeks, try to stay ready, and then, you know, be out at the lake. So, so no, no dark beer for five or six Yeah, I got Guinness on tap at the crib, yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Yeah, good. I know you kind of just touched on it. But, yeah. Uh, you said you go five days a week. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then Saturday, Sunday. How do you balance that work life and that passion life to, you know, extracurricular and coach training? Yeah, great question. So I don't think there is a balance, guys. <laughs> I think coach will speak to this. Being a coach is not in balance. Doing what I do is not in balance. It's like integration. I heard somebody explain that. Like my family now is old enough that they all come to the gym at least a few times a week, right? That they're involved in the businesses. And now I have the freedom because when they were real little, I worked enough to where now my schedule can be as I want it to be, right? I don't miss games. I don't miss practices. Like I don't miss stuff because I worked so hard when I was younger because I started when I was so young to get to where I have more freedom when I got a little bit, old, little bit older. And so the other thing is communication. My wife would be like, yo, like I'd really like to go do this. And I'd be like, well, I got this going on right now. I can't. But she also would help with that balance to say, do you really need to send that extra email right now? Do you really need to not cheat? What do you got going on? So I think it helps with uh, your part. I've been married for 20 years. I think that helps. Like she was early in the game with me. She helped me paint the walls of the first gym. I met her on spring break. I know that's not what anybody's trying to do is meet their wife on spring break, by the way. Just saying. But it happened to me. Uh, Yeah, which is kind of funny. I saw her at the first bar that I went out to in Panama City, and we've been together literally ever since. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) My buddies is even like, gee, what, you going to marry this girl? I'm like, I don't know. But it's kind of funny. But anyway. Next, anybody else? Please. Yeah, uh, we'll go back here, and I'll come back. Go ahead. Yeah. So I've competed at uh, 81, 98, 220, and 242. And so if you guys know much about lifting, Westside Barbell, which is the most like kind of wild strength gym on the whole planet, happens to be in Columbus, Ohio. And I'll tell you a quick story. When I was 17 years old, I did my second powerlifting meet ever. First one I did when I was 16, second one when I was 17. I couldn't even make this up if I tried. There was a powerlifting meet inside of a trailer park in a gym. And uh, I went to it, and it was 1990, 1998, and Westside Barbell comes to it. If you guys ever watched the documentary Westside versus the World, Louis Simmons and all these, they look like it's a biker gang. They're huge. They walk in. Louis got the denim shirt. He benches 600 on his 50th birthday, and I was a 17-year-old kid in the second row. And I was like, what am I watching? But I'm half crazy, so I'm like, fuck with this. Like, I'm into it, right? So 2008, I'm here in Columbus, and I was mostly paying attention to bodybuilding, but I was studying some powerlifting. And I realized what I had watched that day. When I was reading an article, I was like, oh, these guys are here. So I found a way. I mean, I was the only dude not taking drugs that ever went there, probably, you know, on a consistent basis. But because I love it so much, they were willing to teach me. And my best lifts... Now, I was wearing the suits and the craziness and all that, right? Like, I got full in because I wasn't taking the drugs, but they were going drugs plus the gear plus the bench shirts, all that shit. And I was like, just put me in all the extreme shit. I'm ready. I squatted 700 at uh, 225. I squatted 700 at 198. I just last year squatted 694.4 at 181 the day after I did a fucking bodybuilding show. I did a bodybuilding show in Akron on Saturday morning. So I I got up on Friday. I drove to Dayton, weighed in for the powerlifting meet. Came home and went to sleep. The next day, because it's a 24-hour weigh-in, I drove in the morning, did the bodybuilding show, came home, got up, did the powerlifting meet all on the same weekend. I got second in my class in the bodybuilding show, drug tested, then squatted what I thought was an all-time world record as a drug-tested masters because I was 44. 45, 44 at the time, and um, it was a rounded up kilo chart. I squatted 694.4, 
It said 695. I thought I broke the record. I woke up two days later when I saw it on the internet, and it was uh, the exact same thing the other guy squatted 10 years before, but he weighed one pound less than me. So even when I try to be first, dude, I swear I get second. It's just like that. I'm just a six man type of guy. Um, my best bench was 480 in a shirt. My best raw bench was 375. Um, I can bench 300 on any given day, any given time still. And I have one less rotator cuff in this shoulder. I rehabbed it without surgery, ruptured it. I, I've had some pretty crazy lifts. Best deadlift is 575 at pretty much every, every weight class. So yeah, not bad, right? <laughs> You guys can look up on my Instagram. You can see some of the squats are pretty crazy. Uh, anything else? Please, got another one? Good. If you struggle, like, if you, if you don't have the means to start from, let's say you want to start, how do you handle, you know, dealing with the loss of, say, come into it initially, mm -hmm. delaying that gratification, and at least financially, yes. how, do you, how do you go about that? So when I started my first gym, and gyms a little loosely because it was, like, a ladder closet inside of a mini mall on Bryce Road, which is in Reynoldsburg, it was like 900 square feet. I started for five grand. $4,000 on a credit card at 21%. And I had a friend that had, um, we'll say some uh, extracurricular activities where he had an extra cash and I borrowed $1,000 off him, but he only had 900 because he spent 100 at the club. It was a cold college situation. Like, yo, can you get in the safe and give me a G? I need, I'm, I'm 1,000 light. And, um, and so I started for five grand. Um, it, took me a, it took me a while to pay that off. And the delayed gratification was not really about having the lifestyle or the things. I just wanted to see if it would work. So to me, that was gratifying enough. What you guys got to understand is I was making $21 an hour overtime, shoveling coal. When Irene, that was her name, literally, gave me $20 to teach her how to do bicep curls, to me, I was winning. And I was at 20. So to me, I was already successful. This job that I didn't know was possible was working. Now I was like, can I pay my bills on campus? Because I was still living with my friends. So I'm 20, having my own business, but I'm living on the Ohio State's campus with my friends while they're going to school. So I still had like one foot in, one foot out. You know what I mean? So, but I just, to me, it was like a success out the gate just because it was kind of working. And so I think that with your guys' uh, age group, everybody thinks they got to be rich by the time they're 26 and have it figured out. And that's why the whole entrepreneurship stuff when I, was an when I started out being an entrepreneur, it wasn't as cool as it is now. Actually, a lot of people thought I was a loser because I was going to community college and I, had no, and I wanted to lift weights for a living. <laughs> so it's just, I think the delayed gratification, you got the small wins are really key, man. So anything else? Go ahead. What's your worst mistake you Well, you guys will probably enjoy this one. So when I was at MP, it's almost like everything we were doing was working. We um, started sponsoring UFC fighters in 2009 when it was on Spike TV for free before it blew up. Guys, I used to sponsor Conor McGregor for 1500 bucks. Like, I mean, it, I, I had my logo on the UFC, like, mat beside Harley and was going on, like, vacation with, like, Dana White and shit. Like, it was, like, on some whole other level type stuff. And so then I went and got a deal with Mike Vick, Ocho Cinco, um, but... I thought I would get an artist that would help me get out into the mainstream. So I signed Flo Rider for some ridiculous amount of money. I don't even want to, and it was terrible. And it didn't work. And I had to get in the meeting because I, I was originally trying to get 50 Cent before the vitamin water shit. And I actually was in negotiations with his manager, and you guys can look this up. The week I, was, I thought I was going to deal done, he killed himself randomly out of nowhere. Uh, and so Chris Lighty. And so I'm working with this guy and then all of a sudden he's gone. And so then, you know, I'm shifting like, okay, well this, this literally whole deal is not going to happen. So I want to find another person in the space and flow rider was awesome, but it just didn't convert. And so I had to stand in the meeting and be like, I spent 400,000 on flow rider and got no business from it. So that was one of the weirdest probably, but I felt like I could do no wrong. So on the other side of a big win, you have to be real careful. So even with the island, it's our, everything that's going on with it. The bump in equity because I got the utilities on it. The stuff that's happening at the lake, like it's all a win. So the next thing that I do has to be under a microscope so I'm not feeling myself like I can only do it. I lost like a couple hundred on crypto because I thought I could do no wrong because I hit it on Dogecoin. And I go, oh, well, I'm gonna do this one. Lost. So it's like, that's, that's the big key. Whatever, wherever your biggest... Your biggest game you have, 
make sure the next game you come with confidence, but you also do the same preparation. I think that's really important, or even a little bit more. Anybody got anything else? Good? Cool? All right, cool. Thanks, guys.